Vishal Kasriwal, and uh, I work as a uh, senior deep learning software engineer at Intel. Um, so a little bit on my background, I actually come from the uh, field of astrophysics. So I did a PhD in astrophysics, and then I did a postdoc in astrophysics. Uh, Um, you know, a PhD holder and being a professor. Um, and so after having finished my post, well, after having uh, done my postdoc for a year and a half, I decided to venture into another area in life, which was uh, high performance computing. And um, I started working on my skill sets to basically apply high performance computing to deep learning. Um, and, you know, after, um, uh, after learning a little bit, I uh, went to work for a company called Wave Computing. Uh, which is here in the Bay Area in Campbell, California. And the goal of wave computing is to build a cheap, for, uh, sorry, a chip for deep learning. And so I worked there for a, for a, a year and a half, and now I'm at Intel uh, working on, uh, you know, other related things at Intel, which I'll, I'll get into in a bit. Um, so that's my, that's my, my background. Thank you so much, Ushal, for sharing your background. So, Let's get started with some questions specifically really on deep learning, right? So that our audience can get a brief overview or like a high level idea on it. And then we can uh, deep dive into more details. So how would you define deep learning and how is it different from AI and machine learning? Because there's a lot of confusion around these three terms together, especially those who are not super, super technical or those who are in very early in their career. So I'm glad you asked that question because uh, coming from a physics background, it's something that I've thought about a lot. And so sort of here's my take on it. So my take on it is that the ultimate goal in all of this is artificial intelligence. Intelligence is broadly speaking a system that behaves and thinks in uh, a manner that is similar to our own or maybe even superior in some ways. Um, you know, this has been a long cherished goal of um, futurists, science fiction writers, and even even scientists for you know hundreds of years, and and various people have applied their own sort of spin on it and their own criteria. There have been you know various attempts at at getting closer and closer to artificial intelligence, and there's also a lot of uh, effort on defining what it means for some uh, for some system to be artificially intelligent. Um, so, for example, you know one one popular test is this thing called the Turing test, where you basically say okay, it's a box, uh, the, the system is hidden inside a box and you can pose questions to it. And if the response is indistinguishable from a human being, then, uh, you know, the system is artificially intelligent. That That's, you know, one of the base, most basic tests that people have proposed for, um, for you know, determining whether a system is artificially intelligent. Um, On to motivation. One of the big motivations for artificial intelligence is just, it attempts to answer questions about who we are as you know, individuals, as a species. Is it possible for another organism to exhibit the same sort of intelligence that we see in each other? Or is it the case that there's something unique about us that makes it possible for us to display this kind of behavior, but that cannot be replicated by other systems? So that's, that's broadly speaking what the goals of artificial intelligence are. Now the question is, how do you get there? So um, deep learning and machine learning are basically methods for achieving artificial intelligence. So going back to machine learning for a minute, machine learning is a field and deep learning is a subfield within machine learning. So there are various techniques for teaching machines how to learn, um, you know, uh, how to answer various useful questions. And one of the techniques that one is able to apply is this technique called deep learning. And specifically what deep learning does is it uses a, an algorithm known as an artificial neural network to machine learning. So take for example, the question of planets going around the sun. So there's this inverse square law force called gravity. And with knowledge of the force and some mathematics, one can work out with tremendous precision how planets go around the sun. One can, uh, you know, uh, predict all sorts of, effect, of effects that one is able to observe in real life. And then with even more sophistication, when you start throwing in a theory like general relativity, you can even uh, uh, explain anomalous behavior like there's this famous precession of mercury. Now, the interesting thing here is that the system is simple and the system is completely deterministic. 
So what that means is that once the planet is going around the sun, it can be described perfectly um, down to observational error. And the idea is that as you reduce that observational error, you still manage to find that the system behaves the way the equations predict. So this is a deterministic system. And not all systems in life are deterministic. A further complicating matter is that this system is simple, right? Planets going around the sun can be described either using Newtonian physics or you know, Einstein's equations. But fundamentally, it's not a very complicated situation to examine, even if the theories sound complicated when you study them. On the other hand, there are many, many, many systems that one can imagine, systems that one runs across in everyday Take the case of something as simple as a stock in some company. That stock holds value because of the fact that the company is earning revenue and that the company has some assets. But the price of the stock varies dramatically from you know, minute to minute to hours to uh, days and, and months and years. So why does it vary that much? Is the intrinsic value of that stock actually changing as quickly as we perceive it to be when we look at the stock market price? And the simple answer is no. The, the, the actuality of what's happening is that there are human forces that are trying to determine what the value is and they disagree with each other because the system has two features. One is it is very complicated and the other is that it, is, it has an inherent uh, level of stochasticity built into it. Random behavior that you cannot deterministically give the value of. And those two features make modeling a stock market, uh, you know, quote, very difficult using sort of methods that you might traditionally consider to come from science. So one of the goals of machine learning is to be able to perform useful, provide useful predictions for systems that are so complex and so complicated and or behave so indeterministically that um, it is almost hopeless to imagine coming up with an equation to describe them. Um, so that, that's basically what the goal of machine learning is. Now, within machine learning, there are many, many different methods. Uh, you know, uh, there are support vector machines, there are linear regressors, all sorts of different techniques for computing the output that the machine learning system is, is supposed to compute. And one of these methods is the use of artificial neural networks. Now, before the uh, 2010s, people were limited in how big they could make the artificial neural network. So the artificial neural network is, is a system that you can scale up in size. Um, and when you scale the system up in size, um, you find that it predicts values better in, uh, in, in many cases. But um, one feature that is common to all machine learning systems is because there is no inbuilt knowledge of what the system's dynamics are, you have to train them by giving them examples, by giving them samples. So you can think of these machine learning systems as basically being like people and you, you throw examples at them. You know, if you see this, this is the right answer. If you see that, this is the right answer. And, and a good system learns how to predict the output even if the, input, uh, even if the inputs are very different. And so in all of these methods in machine learning, you have two phases. You have a, a training phase where you show the system um, samples and solutions, samples and solutions, and then you have an inference phase where you use this um, trained system to make predictions. So in the case of neural networks, um, up until the 2000s, people were sort of limited in how deep they could make them, how complicated they could make the actual neural network. And then with the use of uh, GPUs, they found that they could begin making these systems very deep, meaning that there'd be many layers in the artificial neural network. And they found that this gave the neural network tremendous predictive power. And that's where that term deep learning comes from. It's because you use a deep neural network to learn the solution to some problem that is intractable using a shallower, um, you know, smaller neural network. So, so that, that should help put, um, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning in some sort of uh, context for uh, everyone. It's, uh, you know, it's a pretty interesting and dynamic field that has developed very quickly over the last uh, nine to 10 years. Awesome. Thank you so much, Vishal, for uh, sharing that this information on deep learning. Really, really helpful. And as you said, like this field is growing, uh, especially in the last nine to 10 years. Uh, so there are, soft, there are a lot of software engineering professionals who really want to get into this particular domain, like deep learning. So how would you suggest uh, like what's an ideal path according to you to 
to make this transition from a software engineering career to a career in deep learning. Systems are very big and very complex and there are many, many, many pieces to the puzzle, right? So there's no such thing as a job description when it comes to what a deep learning software engineer does. So depending upon one's own specialty, there are various sort of aspects of the deep learning software hardware tool chain that, that one works on. So for example, in my case, I don't train deep neural networks to solve a business problem. My job is to write the software that runs on the hardware that is developed by the people in Intel's uh, hardware division. And this, this software is designed to be a very low level um, set of um, you know, software um, codes and algorithms that is called many, 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 many times by the people who actually you know, train neural networks for a business purpose. So, so as you can see, that already establishes that there are many different sort of entry points that one can make into this area. So my personal philosophy is one has to recognize one's own strengths and one's own um, existing corpus of knowledge and then decide how is it that I can apply this to a, um, you know, a problem that is using deep learning to solve uh, some business need. So for example, if you are a person who does you know, uh, hardware verification, well, there are people in the world who are working on chips for deep learning. And I'll, I, I can talk a little bit about why this is the case. And uh, they need to have their hardware verified before the hardware is you know, uh, frozen um, so that their product uh, is competitive and uh, has a, you know, a, a, a place in the market. And, and that's where you could come in. That's where you could, you could uh, uh, break into the field of deep learning. Now, on the other hand, there are some people who come from a more um, analytical background, um, typically people who come from physics, astrophysics, math, and these people have uh, knowledge of how to go about, um, you know, taking data, processing it, organizing it, and then asking meaningful questions that you can apply, uh, that you can learn uh, answers to by using a deep learning algorithm. So that's the sort of more data science-y, um, you know, And, and you could fall anywhere in the middle. There are many, many, many problems when it comes to engineering a full system for deep learning that, that you, can, you need a very different set of skills for um, where you can find application for whatever skills it is that you've developed over the years. Um, you know, right from how to process large amounts of data, how to store large amounts of data, where to store large amounts of data, how to make it easily, uh, easily available to how to actually find uh, an algorithm that works for a specific problem. And then, you know, you have the standard sort of uh, software engineering that needs to be done where you're creating an API for some user who does not want to understand the system to be able to use the system. So, so my answer is find your own strengths and this strengths would be most useful and critical and try to hone your strengths so that they can be applied there. Mm-hmm.